Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third webinar meeting of the INSBD, which is again related to COVID-19 problem. Basically, today we'll have a program subdivided in two parts. The first one will discuss the aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2 infection and the environmental intervention that can be used to mitigate the spreading. Interestingly, the second part will be devoted to the pathogenesis of COVID-19 and to the current problem and situation on vaccines. You can write your question and answer in the Q&A space and the speakers will answer you immediately after the speech. Questions and discussion will be also held by our board of expertise panelists, including Melian Wang from Hunan Provincial People Hospital, China, and one of the is one of the ISFD executive committee members and president elect of our society. Dr. Dejan Yakimowski from the University of Buffalo, which is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Society. Finally, Dimitris Drikakis, the Professor of Science and Engineer and Medical School of the University of Nicosia, Cyprus, who studied the contaminated saliva droplet spread, face mask, and the impact of weather on COVID-19 infection. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the webinar today, Marcella Lagana. She's part of the ISPD Executive Committee. She's a bioengineer of the Don Carlo Gnocchi Foundation in Milan, Italy. She works at the MRI lab of a Center of Advanced Diagnostic Therapy and Rehabilitation for this institution, where advanced MRI methods are used for diagnostic purposes and for monitoring the rehabilitation treatment. Please, Marcella. Thank you, Professor Zamboni, for your introduction. Uh, so I'm pleased to moderate this webinar and I'll begin introducing the first speaker, Professor Bex, that I know for many years. Clive Bex is an Emeritus Professor of Applied Physiology at Leeds Beckett University. He's both a physiologist and a bioengineer specialized in, in the interdisciplinary translational research for interpreting clinical and biological systems. As such, he has worked on various projects in neurovascular medicine and infectious disease transmission with clinical teams around the world, among, among which ours. And during the pandemic, he served on the Royal Society Rapid Ass Assistance in Modeling the Pandemic Working Group, and is currently working with various teams in the UK developing technologies to mitigate transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, please, uh, Clive. Thank you. Um, uh, so thank you for welcoming me here. I'm gonna share my slide. I hope it, uh, it comes up, my presentation. Um, yep, yeah, I can't see it there. Um, Just excuse me for a minute. This uh, uh, the screen has not come up yet, so I'm trying to uh, share it. Um, yes, here we are. All right. Right. So. Thank you. My name's Clive Beggs, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Most of you will know me from uh, the work that I've done on neurovascular disease. And um, you might not realize that before I 
went into that field into neurology that I actually led a research team in infectious disease control at the University of Leeds in the UK uh, and so I've done an awful lot of work on transmission of infections in the past and particularly uh, airborne infections so um, when the pandemic came out uh, and came around I was I was basically pressed into uh, action to help uh, fight that in the UK. So I'm going to talk about aerosol transmission of uh, COVID-19 and also ways in which we can mitigate its spread. <clears throat> so the work that I'm doing here is a collaboration between myself and Eldad Avital at uh, Queen Mary University of London. Now, before I talk about uh, my particular work, I ought to get, make you familiar with how co um, COVID-19 is transmitted. Now, it's actually uh, um, a droplet-borne disease, just like influenza. And when you think about droplets and uh, the spread of droplets, traditionally, people have thought about these very large droplets we can see here on the left-hand side that drop out, at fall out. They're, in fact, larger than 100 microns. What happens with those is they come out and they behave ballistically, and they tend to fall within one one and a half meters. So if you stand two meters away, you socially distance, you're protected from these. But what was wrongly realized really is that there are an awful lot more aerosol particles that come out there, a lot more droplets when people speak, sing, cough, or even just breathing. And in fact, about 85% of the aerosol particles produced are actually less than 100 microns. And these never actually touch the ground. They evaporate down to aerosol particles and project out in a kind of cone in front of the individual. Or in a, in a still room, they do that. Some get caught up in a, in a thermal plume, which I'll talk about later. But they can project much further than that two meters. <clears throat> and if we look at these smaller droplets, they evaporate very rapidly because they've got a small mass and a large surface area. And they evaporate down to something smaller than 100 microns in diameter. Now, that's, uh, the, the size of them is up for debate because it depends on how much proteins in the saliva, how much uh, uh, the, the environmental conditions and everything. But we think the general rule is that they are less than 50 microns. And that's really important because at 50 microns, the descending velocity in a still room under Stokes's law is about 0 0.1, 0 0.08 meters per second. So that's very, very slow. And why that's important is because you may not realize it, but your skin temperature is about 33 degrees, your clothes temperature about 30 degrees. So you actually heat up all the air that's passing in the room. You actually have a, a convective current passing over the body and passing up above your head for about a meter above your head a constant stream of warm air passing up. And that's called a thermal plume. And the velocities can be much greater than this descending velocity for a, a, a 50 micron particle. In fact, for a 100 micron particle, they can be greater. So particles, especially the finer ones, get entrained into that thermal plume and dissipated around in the room space uh, and trapped under the ceiling. And anything that escapes the thermal plume, because there are other thermal plumes and this sets up convection currents in the room space, the aerosol cloud that's produced tends to rise and can be dissipated widely around the room space. So it's a very complex fluid mechanics situation, but it can be broadly bro broken down into two zones of transmission. The near field, which is illustrated here on the, the left, where you've got the ballistic droplets, and if you evade those, you can get caught. And this is probably the most important route uh, by the aerosol cloud that's emitted, which has a high concentration of aerosols, of fine aerosols. And if you breathe these in, uh, there's a good chance that you might, if they're, if they're infected there, get a high viral load and may possibly contract an infection. That happens within seconds. However, if you're away from that in other parts of the room, you're not safe because what happens is that aerosol cloud disperses into the room. And if there is an emitter 
in that room, especially if there's a super emitter in that room or several emitters in the room. So you might have a nightclub or a pub or something like that where you have a lot of people there all talking and when people talk you emit a lot of aerosols and the louder you talk the more aerosols you produce and what happens is uh, the concentration builds up in the space and if the space is poorly ventilated you can get a a dose that if you stay there for several hours even out of uh, 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 far in the far field you can receive a dose that might cause an infection the, mitigate, the way you mitigate this traditionally is to ventilate the room space and to flush out these aerosols. Now let's move on specifically to talk about temperature and humidity, which is the work I've been doing recently, and seasonal changes. Now, both it, it, it's probably worth com comparing the SARS-CoV-2 virus to influenza A. Both influenza A and SARS-CoV-2 virus are um, what we call RNA viruses, and they're both enveloped. And that means that they behave roughly similar in the environment. And um, both are transmitted by the same route of, of transmission. And in fact, it's, it, it's, it's now becoming clear that we are not having an influenza outbreak that we usually have each winter because people are socially distancing, wearing masks. So the same route is, is, is applicable both to SARS and influenza, although influenza is less transmissible than than COVID-19. So I went and looked at data and here's some data for, uh, these are all enveloped RNA viruses. And this, this orange line here is the, is the influenza A virus. And this was data collected in, uh, in Scotland in, in 2019. And you can see there's an inverse relationship with temperature. When it's cool, you get high transmission of influenza. When it's warm and hot in the summer, you get low transmission. In fact, it peaked around about 12th of January. And we see a very similar seasonal aspect to um, SARS-CoV-2. So what we did was uh, some meta-analysis. We, 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 I, I went and searched for all the experiments that I could find that on which people have looked at aerosols containing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and I came up with 21 experiments and five research teams. And they all use the same apparatus, which is a Gold, Goldberg rotating drum. And this apparatus enables you to keep the aerosol suspended in the air and control the temperature and humidity. To, and then you can sample to look at the viability of them. And as with in aerosols and on surfaces, viruses exhibit an exponential decay. And they conform to a, a first order exponential decay equation, as you can see here. And the key term is this K term, which is the decay constant, which has units per minute or per second. Now, all the, all the teams that we looked at, all the experiments, they recorded the K value, the decay constant, and the temperature and the relative humidity. Now, there's a problem with relative humidity. It's not an absolute value. And many biologists and many medics don't realize this. It's actually a ratio of the observed vapor pressure to the saturated vapor pressure, and it changes with temperature. So it's not a good uh, statistical to, uh, measure to use. So what I did was I went back to the fundamental psychometric variables, which are to the psychometric, the science of air water mixtures, and did some linear regression. And I found that I could build a model which could predict for any air condition, the, uh, sorry about this, um, I could predict the, with reasonable accuracy, an R squared of uh, 0.72, the, um, the decay constant. And from that, then I could uh, predict the half-life of the virus. And you can see that these, despite them all being done in different labs, you get a, a lot of uh, consistency between the results. And we have a model in the end, the, the optimum model we came up with had specific enthalpy, which is a measure of the energy in the air, the vapor pressure of the air, which is the fundamental unit affecting the humidity of the air, and specific volume, which is the inverse of density. And uh, I'm trying to get rid of this uh, thing that keeps appearing on the screen. I don't know whether it's in everyone's screen and I don't know how to do that. Um, 
So I'm going to go back. Forgive me. We'll have to live with that. So what I did here was I um, uh, took this model and applied it to real Met data. And uh, we got da Met data from London, Paris and Milan. And um, what I could do with it using, the, this was hourly Met data, but using the, um, uh, the, the decay constant equation, I could predict the decay constants and then the half-lives. And you can see that during the winter, there's no decay of the aerosol, in, of, of the virus in the aerosols. But when we come to around about April, it starts to increase and they decay rapidly in the summer around about August. And you can see this is roughly an inverse of the relationship of the infections for France, Italy, and UK. Of course, those are for countries, these are for cities. So you can only make a, a rough comparison. And just to take Milan, for example, the, um, the half-life in March was about seven or eight hours in an aerosol for the virus, whereas in the summer, it was just 26 minutes. So in other words, there was a much lower viral load in the aerosols for the same amount of time in this in the in the summer months. Of course, that was outside air. This is indoor air. And indoor air, we can track the disease indoors. So if we compare, for example, an outside condition of zero and 90 degree, 90 percent RH at that level, which is typical of a winter's day outside, um, you've got an indefinite. There's no decay of the of the virus. Whereas if you heat the air up inside to say 21 degrees and 30%, which is a typical winter's condition where it's very dry, the air is, then the, the, the virus lasts for a half-life of 110 minutes. Of course, in summer, where it's humid at 25 and 60% RH, then it can reduce to 26 minutes. And if you actually take just a room temperature at 21 degrees and look at the conditions between the dry winter's day and an inside in, in summer and a humid day, you'll see that there's a threefold decrease in the half-life. So there's an awful lot you can say about this, but I've kind of summarized it in this table. So what we can say is the, basically the half-life is much longer in winter. So basically when you inhale a, an aerosol droplet, you're likely to have a much higher viral load in a building at that time. Also, because the air is drier in winter, indoors, the aerosols are likely to evaporate much quicker. So you're gonna get many more smaller aerosols and these will stay in the air for much longer. So your chances of inhaling them are much greater. You're likely to have less well-ventilated spaces because people don't into open windows, they recirculate air in the HVAC systems. People spend more time indoors in winter. And lastly, your nasal cavity is drier and you may have lower vitamin D levels. All factors that kind of basically are acting in favor of the spread of the infection. We don't know which of these are crucial, but it's important to understand them. Let's now, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about the interventions. Now I should say that we are at this moment, I'm leading the team in the UK and we're negotiating with the government to run a, a large, epidemiological trial of UV light, uh, UV air disinfection in schools in the UK. Uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that at this, uh, at this moment because we haven't got time. All I'm gonna say is that it's been known for a long time that you can disinfect air with UVC light uh, and disinfect surfaces as well with UVC light at 254 nanometers. And um, uh, the way we use it, uh, I, I did my first paper on this uh, back in the 1990s and uh, Wells, William Wells in Harvard was using it to disinfect TB and prevent TB and transmission in hospitals back in the 1930s and 40s. And basically you have fittings at high level and create a UV field and these fittings are shielded from the people below. What happens at that, uh, at 254 nanometers, the the photons of light are very, very uh, energetic. And when they penetrate the, uh, the, the microorganism or the viral particle, they basically damage the nucleic material and create dimers, mutations that prevent it from uh, uh, infecting people. And the key value, I haven't got time to talk about this here, the key value is the Z value, the UV susceptibility constant.
The greater this value, the easier it is to kill the microorganism with UV. So what we did, and we published this, I should say the previous work on the, uh, on the psychometrics and the air and temperature was just published in PAGA two days ago. So it's there on the web if anyone wants to check it out. Uh, this work we published last year in PAGA. Um, and what we did was we looked, again, it was really meta-analysis with, with uh, uh, a feasibility study. We looked at the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and compared it with SARS-CoV-1. And you can see that the values are an order of magnitude greater for the Z value. In other words, it is much easier to kill using UV light in, in liquids here. From our point of view, an even better uh, finding is that it's easy to kill in the air. When you actually irradiate, use a UV field on viruses in the air, they're even more susceptible than they are in liquids. However, nobody has yet uh, irradiated the SARS-CoV-2 virus with uh, uh, UVC light. So we had to go for surrogates here. And the closest surrogate is the mouse coronavirus. And you can see again that they are easier to kill on the whole than um, the uh, than influenza, for example. So this is very positive. In fact, what we found was that uh, it looks like the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is about as easy to kill with UV light as mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the causative agent of tuberculosis. And people have been using UVC light to disinfect and protect spaces from TB transmit transmission for nearly a hundred years now. So this looks positive. So what we did was a feasibility study. Let me show you how we plan to use this and how it's used generally. You create, we call it upper room uh, UVC, upper room UV germicidal irradiation. And you create a, uh, an open field at high level above the heads of the individuals. And this is shielded so the, the, it's got kind of uh, louvers on it. So the people down here cannot see the source. So they can't get damaged by the UV. And then you rely on natural convection currents in the room space to, to let the particles percolate through the field and disinfect them. And you can get very high equivalent air change rates. It's very effective at dis disinfecting room spaces. And here we have a couple of fittings. This is a wall mounted fitting. This is a uh, pendant fitting suspended from the ceiling. So what we did was a feasibility study, and this was a computer-based study. And we set up an office building, we set up a room space, and then we put in, we used Mel first, he was at Harvard and did a lot of work on TB uh, and UV. He used his recommendation of uh, 50 microwatts per centimetre squared, which he used for TB, which is really a 30 watt fitting in, uh, in this size office space. And we, we looked to see how well we could uh, kill the virus or inactivate the virus under different room conditions in terms of uh, uh, ventilation rates. And we found that we could easily kill it. We could easily get a very high disinfection rate. Um, I would guess that actually 35 uh, microwatts per centimeter squared is quite sufficient to uh, disinfect against SARS-CoV-2. It's, it's fairly easy to kill. So this is all positive stuff. In other words, it looks pos very positive as an intervention. Uh, against uh, the transmission of far field transmission of aerosols and COVID-19 in buildings. But there's a big but. It's not being tried. It's not being tested. And that's why we are trying to do the epidemi epidemiological trial to see if it actually reduces the incidence of the disease. In fact, we're also going to look at other respiratory diseases as well. But uh, there is a difference also between this and tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by um, uh, droplet nuclei, which are really less than 10 microns that can travel deep down into the lungs, into the alveoli of the lungs to cause the infection. Whereas um, COVID-19 is caused by um, respiratory sized, well, droplets that are uh, of a range that are larger than that, that actually are inhaled. Really, we're thinking anything from 50 microns under maybe 20, 30 microns, but certainly 50 microns and then possibly larger. They're inhaled and impact on the ACE2 receptors in the nasal cavity and also in the oral cavity. 
uh, all in the upper respiratory tract, although there is some evidence that it could go also deep down into the lungs. So the smaller particles it should not be discounted as well. But those larger particles tend to fall out of the air slowly if the air current is not well mixed and they could be partially, only partially irradiated. So we don't know about that. So we need to keep the air well mixed, which is exactly what we have here in this study at Penn State University. It really shows that the, 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 it, the boosts the effectivity of the, uh, of the upper room irradiation system. Similarly, Shelley Miller at, uh, Shelley Miller at uh, Boulder also demonstrated this, that we need to have movement. So we're planning to put fans in to, to supplement the air movement and create the disinfection. Now, people are using this in the United States. They're just, these have just been put in Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn in New York, put in 700 fittings. They're just putting them in just in case, hopefully to prevent the, 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 uh, the virus. Uh, but they're not doing an epidemi epidemiological trial as far as we know. And I've talked to the guys at Harvard about this, uh, uh, my contacts there. And um, uh, we're trying to get them involved in our study as well on this one here. So it's, um, the jury's out on it, I suppose, but it looks very promising. So just to conclude, temperature and humidity hugely important. We don't fully understand it, but it seems to certainly the virus spreads more when the air is cooler and drier. But there may be ways in which we mit can mitigate the spread by the way we actually uh, heat and uh, humidify our buildings. Air, air disinfection looks very promising, UV air disinfection. Uh, in theory, all the lab work suggests it should work, but there is no epidemiological evidence at the moment other than for TB and measles, which is very old. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Betts, uh, for, for your uh, clear and uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, if someone has uh, any questions, uh, please write them in the Q&A space. Questions, Marcella? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, hi. 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 Uh, Clive, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, just to mention, I mean, it was a fantastic coverage of all the topics uh, across uh, transmission and uh, uh, fluid dynamics heat transfer. Just to let you know that uh, we have um, published a series of studies, uh, five papers from my group, covering exactly the same topics. <laughs> so it's good actually perhaps to get together and talk about mm -hmm. it. Uh, some of the papers actually were ad adopted by uh, government uh, yeah. in various places. Uh, one, a couple of uh, only observations. Uh, is relative humidity and temperature, but also the wind, especially if you are in an open environment. Yeah. And in our first paper in May 2020, we showed that the wind can play an important role and also can affect the evaporation of droplets. So this is another parameter. Could, could, could I comment? Oh, yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I'll comment on that. It's very apposite for what I'm doing. Uh, you may notice that my official affiliation is the School of Sport, which is a long story, yes. but I've been working in sport before I retired. Uh, um, I'm now semi-retired. Um, and I'm actually still advising the, uh, the, the sporting authorities in the UK. And one of the things that uh, they are concerned about is that... Um, is that... Uh, is this whole thing about indoors and outdoors and transmission and infection. They're not seeing, as everyone has seen, the transmission outdoors. And of course, they've got a lot of spaces that are semi-enclosed, yes. you know, like stands and things like that and arenas. But in fact, I was just saying exactly the same thing. What we, we're doing computational fluid dynamics at Queen Mary's. And what we are seeing is thermal plumes are very important. And of course, we, we're seeing, certainly from breathing and speaking, the particles, certainly the finer aerosol particles getting drawn up into the plumes and just going up and they're getting trapped under the ceiling and they're moving around the room and like a bait ball almost, you know, around the room. But of course that doesn't occur outside. Yeah, so yeah. they just go straight up and then the near field transmission, you've got more air velocities. So high, greater air velocities than you get indoors and that breaks that up. So if you're gonna get, a, unless you're very close, 
you're not going to take in a high load, viral mm -hmm. load. So I agree totally with what I'll, you're I'll send you. I'll send you the papers, actually, because the first paper I mentioned uh, was discussed by the SAGE committee, actually, in June 2020. And they didn't adopt the recommendations for the six meter distance that we suggested if you have a light breeze, because the distance can be. So you go to a pub in the yeah. summer and you keep yourself very close to the others, then you are at risk. But anyway, without keep the long story short, I'll send you the papers and you can look at them. Yeah, yeah, certainly I, I'm working with people on Sage as well, so Kath notes yeah. on that. So the second and final comment is that uh, evaporation is very important, but one of the things that was missing actually from the literature over the past 50 years, and it was, it was incorrect, was the unsteady evaporation, because everybody considered the nasal timber, the uh, mass transfer, uh, criteria based on steady heat transfer. And I will send you another study we published in, uh, which is linked to the weather effects in yeah. September 2020 in the physics of fluids um, that addresses exactly this point. It's not only the, the evaporation, is how the evaporation actually uh, changes in an unsteady manner that influences the concentration rate of the virus transmission. Could, and, and could, this could is I, yeah. yeah. Could I comment on that as well? I think that's really important. I'm very interested. I did work years ago in this was in the days of gram negative infections yes. and uh, and uh, and also MRSA. And we actually looked at the humidity for the, the Department of Health in the UK. And we looked at osmotic shock and we did experiments on that because with gram negatives, you get swelling of the things and they've got a much stronger wall than the phospholipid bilayer on the envelope virus. Mm -hmm. So I'm particularly interested in that the, the in, in environmental me mediations and rapid changes because I think that will stress them yeah. and uh, and cause damage because you're going to get osmotic changes both between the envelope and the capsid yeah. and also in the in the in the droplets. Yeah. I'll but, be uh, after the seminar and I will send you the information. With seminar, that. great to talk to you. Great to talk to you. I, I know everyone's listening here. Thank so, you very yeah. much for the exciting presentation. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, I can um, I can invite uh, Professor Baselli to uh, to do another question if he has. Uh, Professor Baselli is the discussant of uh, this uh, first part of the webinar. He's a professor of bioengineering at the Department of Electronics, Information and Bio Bioengineering at Polytechnic of Milan in Italy. He's an expert on physiology system modeling, and uh, we've been collaborating for more than 15 years. Oh yes, uh, thanks Clive, uh, really impressive presentation and uh, impressive data we did really lack. I have uh, to confess to you that I'm not working in this field, but uh, since uh, the early summer when uh, the pandemia went uh, down and uh, it seems for a few, few more months uh, over actually, uh, I was really concerned and uh, indeed frustrated because nothing was done foreseeing uh, the bad uh, season which was coming mm. next. And uh, really, uh, I was concerned exactly for the indoor situation. And uh, uh, all I've seen during the summer uh, it was that uh, we little by little realized uh, just that opening the window is not a bad idea in this condition. It's really uh, damping the, the, the aerosols uh, indoor. And uh, 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 now comes uh, my questions for, for your comments. Uh, do you think, uh, first of all, that uh, this uh, uh, indoor way of uh, diffusion by aerosol is uh, the real explanation why the pandemia hits so uh, in a severe, so hard uh, in Western countries where uh, we have a lot of indoor living, air conditioning, etc. Second, uh, I was. Uh, absolutely concerned from uh, the few episodes in uh, just uh, in the beginning at the beginning of the summer uh, when uh, of uh, some uh, focal spot uh, of pandemia coming back uh, from uh, slaughterhouses which are a huge building 
absolutely closed with air conditioning. The, I was told that uh, the refresh of air is uh, very, very poor, say half volume per hour. So wasn't, wasn't that really uh, a red alarm that has been uh, completely neglected? Please, your comments. Right, well, the, the, with the first one, um, which was about the aerosols and about the, uh, the and transmission. Countries. So, sorry? And Western countries. And Western countries, yes. Yeah, I think that's, uh, we, we, there's a lot of things there mixed up in it. Uh, I mean, as you get towards the equator, I mean, uh, take a place like India, right? Now they've got a lot of problems with uh, COVID there, but per capita, per head of the population, they've got a lot less than in Italy or the UK or, or the USA. Yeah. So um, they've, they have a lot higher sunlight, right? Now we've got a, we've got a bit of a, a contradiction here because if sunlight, certainly sunlight inactivates the, the virus, but if people are contracting it indoors, it shouldn't really have much effect on it. It might affect their vitamin D levels and their susceptibility. But I think that, that being outdoors is, is one of the key things to this. So the more we spend outdoors, um, the, the, frankly, the virus is, 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 is much less able to travel by aerosols, as yeah. we've discussed. So I think that is a crucial, crucial thing there. We then come on to the buildings. We have to save energy, many buildings in, in, in the West and in, in, in North America, in the UK, in Italy, uh, France, have become, we use sealed air conditioned buildings. You can't even open the windows. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you air condition is that you actually cool the air down to temperature, but you also dehumidify, so you make it drier. Yeah. Also, we often recirculate the air. So we take it in, the, the, the heating and ventilation air conditioning system takes the air and circulates it round because it, it costs money to cool the air down or heat it. You know, in winter we, we heat it, we recirculate it. So we're blowing it back round. And so we've created an environment where the virus can spread very easily in that situation. But there's also the situation where, which I'll come on to the food processing in a minute. Um, Work has been done about the amount of aerosols and you get a kind of almost exponential increase in aerosol production when you increase the volume of your speech. Or indeed, if you sing, you get the vocal cords produce another set of fine aerosols. So if people are in nightclubs where there's music playing, they have to speak loud to talk to each other and oh. close up. So suddenly we've got a lot of near field, even if we before we start about the far field. And then we get, they go home and transmit it to their families. You know, so we have, they become kind of super spreading events. And we've seen that with nightclubs and, and church services even. Mm -hmm. When we come to the meat processing there, we've got it all coming together. What we've got is an area where we have to have the area cool, very cool. So you've got air conditioning, drying the air, taking the air down and the air can't hold much moisture. When it's cold so you're down at um i don't know what they are um but maybe less than 10 degrees or so people are uh they're a cool environment and so that's an environment where the virus can stay ar around a lot people are working close together in on production lines maybe it's noisy so they have to shout so if they're not wearing masks and the whole point of a mask is it sends the aerosols upwards and if they're poorly ventilated you've got all the environments for the transmission of the disease. Um, and I, I think on my research list of things to understand, what I want to understand is um, the impact of the aerosols, where they're impacting in the body, uh, uh, in the nasal cavity, and the size of those aerosols, and then seeing how that relates to the... Um, to the to the environment, the, the the environment and the spread of the aerosols. So we're doing computational fluid dynamics at the moment, CFD work, to look where they're going, and then we'll change the evaporation rates in that, hopefully in time. But it may be that in the summer, in the winter, we're getting 
smaller aerosols going deeper into the lungs. And we've got ACE2 receptors deeper in the lungs. And that might be producing a more severe disease. And I think the jury's out on that. It needs to be looked at. Okay, I don't see any questions from uh, uh, the attendees. So I have a, a very last uh, question and is let's consider the volume of uh, a mask which, which is about one centimeter cube and uh, the volume of air one uh, a person is breathing in one hour, which is about half a meter cube. Uh, there is uh, say six orders of magnitude difference. So my comment is, and uh, I want to know your opinion, that uh, face masks are absolutely needed against droplets but uh, they probably do very uh, have a very poor action against aerosols because i with this huge difference of volume it's clear that after say one minute the the face mask is uh, uh, is in an equilibrium with the aerosol and what uh, it uh, is uh, slowing down in the inlet from the mouth uh, is uh, releasing uh, uh, out of uh, far for, from uh, the person. And so probably we shouldn't indoor, we shouldn't feel protected uh, by uh, face masks if we don't treat the indoor air. Yeah, can I, can I get, just quickly answer that? Um, first of all, there's two things. Face masks protect other people. Um, yeah. They do do that. Uh, and I, I'll say a little bit about that first before they protect you. So if you put the mask on, if you do slur and photography of the, you know, looking at the air coming out, which has been done, when you put the mask on the face, the, the aerosols tend to come out through the top, right? Even a poor mask. And so rather than project, projected in the cone onto the person in front, they're displaced into the room space they're also impacting on that mask as well so they're impacting on it so you're reducing the 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 cone that's coming out into in the near field but you are you are sending it upwards which hopefully can be ventilated away or impacted on something else so in a way that is helping to protect so i think that's needed in in closed spaces especially vehicles and things like that so uh, i can see the, the the value of that with the Obviously, with the, the face mask, it depends on the, uh, the quality of the mask. If it's a respirator, it's able to take down to very small particles, then they will protect the person. But it's got to be close fitting. So many surgical masks and other masks are not close fitting. The air can come in through the sides um, and many of the finer particles will go through. But there is a spectrum of particles. And those spectrum of particles, the larger ones will be impacted on that mask. Yes. And, that, that, and that, that is some benefit. I think there is still some benefit <laughs> because it's taking out some of those larger particles. So even, uh, but I wouldn't rely on it. It's not a safe thing. But of course, really, when you look at the kinetics of it and the, and the epidemiology of it, um, the key thing is time, right? Other than the, the thing, the near field where it hits you and you're, taken in a large dose if you go into a shop to buy something with your not very good mask on if you can minimize your exposure that's good because the less time you spend in there the less time you have a chance to get an infection and i think maybe okay okay so I think, uh, uh, maybe we have another question from Diane. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bex, for the excellent presentation. My question is, given that UV irradiation requires some um, investment in clinics and things like that, will it only humidifiers help or is it going to be counterproductive in terms of uh, indoor closed spaces? Yeah, right. So a good, very good question, Dijan. Um, the, you know, humidifier, the jury's out. We, we are only exploring this. We just do not know whether to humidify, it would seem, I would suggest that, uh, and I'm trying to talk to the building engineering of 
the building people in the UK. Uh, my thing would be to put the heating up to a higher temperature and humidity up, and that, that may actually help to mitigate the spread. But um, one of the problems is that there just hasn't been decent epidemiological work of all this stuff. And it is really difficult to do because uh, unlike a, a trial where you've got a, 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 a pill of some nature, where you're actually got a drug of some nature, you can give people a, a, you know, a, a placebo or not a placebo and do a randomized trial. Um, in our case, we're looking at schools uh, and we're having uh, we've got a three arm study that we're doing with the uh, with the with the schools, and uh, we've got ten schools with HEPA filters in. They're high performance filters. Ten schools with the UV and ten schools control, and and we're having to do every classroom and things in this school. We've got a bill that's coming out over four million or something. We're having to cut it down, and I, and we've got no to get the statistical powers. We we. We're guessing half of it because the last study we could find was from 1954 in this uh, area it's a very difficult thing to do but we're working with a really top epidemiological te team in the uk that can uh, get access to the schools and also get all the medical records and and so we've got something called track and trace in the uk which we're not we've not done particularly well with covid i have to say but we're doing quite well on vaccines. Well, the vaccines are not helping us because the, the rates are going down now. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. You know, that's all I can say. Really. Important question, given that the ease of putting a room humidifier in any room you want to try to control is very tempting, but without the data, I agree that, uh, that it's necessary to have yeah. that. And, and there's things like, what, what conditions do you need? People are selling UV lamps everywhere, selling ionizers. Some of them are dangerous. The question is, how many do you need in a room? What size? It's just like a dose with a drug. People don't realize this. You know, it's, uh, you know, you put a, a sublethal dose in, you don't, you don't get the, you know, the, the desired effect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Clive. I think uh, we have to move uh, to the next uh, and last uh, uh, speaker. So uh, this speaker is Mario Clerici. He's full professor of uh, immunology and uh, head of the Department of Physiopathology and Transplantation at the University of uh, Milan, in Italy. He's also the scientific director of the Scientific Institute uh, the Gnocchi Foundation in Milan. His research interests include the innovative research in the immunopathology of human diseases and evolutionary genetics in multiple sclerosis, autistic spectrum disorder, children's and Alzheimer's disease. For the recent pandemic, he studied the virucidal effect of UVC radiation on SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 transmission during pregnancy, and he will now explain us the various vaccines against COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Professor Clerici. Thank you, uh, Marcella. <clears throat> Marcella, thanks to uh, all of you for you know being here and listen, listening to this webinar. I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna um, open my slides. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. All right. Do you see? Do, do, do you do you see these slides? Angela? Not yet. Not yet. Of course, like when you try. Okay, here they are. All right. Okay. So uh, as you said, like, and thanks for 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 um, saying that, and thanks to the to the previous previous speaker because like he's a. Uh, Presentation was like a really really high quality. Uh, we also published on uh, the effect of uh, UVC on uh, on UVC on um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but I'm not gonna discuss that uh, today. I'm gonna uh, move on and I'm gonna uh, switch topics. So essentially, I will discuss with you uh, vaccines for COVID-19. Um, I will start start out with like you know very basic questions, uh, immunological questions, and essentially, what is a vaccine? A vaccine and what should a vaccine do? It's very simple. A vaccine is a compound that utilizes 
um, antigenic uh, material proteins, RNA uh, from a pathogen to prime naive lymphocytes and induce their differentiation into memory cells. Essentially, it's you know, basically it's very simple. A vaccine is uh, a change in the nature of the immune response from primary to secondary. Why is that uh, useful? Because primary immune responses are, you know, slow uh, and uh, not very powerful. So like the first time we, we, we get in touch with the virus, with the pathogen, it takes uh, the immune system, you know, seven, 10, 12 days to produce uh, 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 um, antibodies and to generate uh, cytotoxic T cells. And the amplitude of the response is not so high. So it's not um, from a qualitative point of view a very good uh, response and it's delayed in uh, time. The, se the secondary immune uh, response in, con in contrast is much faster um, and uh, antibodies can be seen within one to three days after the exposure to, 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 to the virus or the bacteria. And it's much more powerful. With the vaccine, we induce uh, the generation of a secondary uh, immune uh, response and that's gonna protect us when we get in touch with the virus or the um, bacteria. This, this is the only immunological slide I'm gonna show you, so like uh, don't uh, worry. Um, naive cells are the ones that haven't got in touch yet with the, path the pathogen that they are uh, specific for. After they get in touch with a virus or a bacteria, they differentiate in Th1, Th2, Th17, etc. And those are uh, effector cells. Those are cells that uh, inactivate, uh, neutralize, kill uh, the pathogen we have uh, been uh, um, infected with. But a small portion of cells uh, differ uh, differentiates into central memory cells. These are cells that uh, live with us inside our body for we don't know exactly for how long, but presumably for like, you know, many, many years. And they maintain, they retain the memory of having been in touch with that virus, that uh, pathogen. Those central memory cells are the ones that are at the basis of uh, secondary immune uh, responses. And those are the cells that are elicited uh, by a vaccine. So it's very simple. It's very tricky, but like it makes all of the difference in the uh, world. Um, vaccines have to generate uh, um, um, antibodies and they have to generate a cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Because why? Well, the reason it's very clear because pathogens uh, um, outside the host cell are neutralized by um, uh, antibodies. But once they penetrate into the host cell, antibodies don't work anymore. So we need cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Viruses outside the host cell are neutralized by antibodies and therefore a vaccine should generate uh, uh, antibodies to prevent uh, the infection of the host cell. But once the virus infects the host cell, and anti anti antibodies are useless, and we will need a set of toxic T lymphocytes to destroy, to kill the infected cell. So a vaccine that works uh, uh, optimally will uh, induce both antibodies and uh, CTLs. Um, so, uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's not the first virus that, it, it's not the first coronavirus that jumps species, species and gets into uh, humans. We have uh, at least seven uh, coronaviruses uh, that like since, uh, for the, probably like within the last eight uh, centuries have, jo have jumped uh, and have uh, infected uh, humans. The first um, four of these uh, viruses uh, essentially like are responsible for very mild uh, flu-like uh, uh, diseases. SARS-CoV, which broke into humans in uh, 2002, provoked a small uh, epidemic of uh, uh, dangerous uh, flu in that, thank goodness, was limited to, mostly limited to China. MERS uh, is still present, but uh, the, the 
animal host of mares are uh, camels. So like mares is very deadly, like kills 30% of patients that uh, it uh, uh, infects, but it's limited to the Middle East. And then there is very SARS-CoV-2, which uh, you know, has been with us for 15, 20 months. Uh, all coronaviruses come from uh, a natural host, usually a bat, and they use an uh, uh, intermediate host before they move on into uh, humans. Uh, I want to point out, uh, stress out, that we do not yet know which is the natural host of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the intermediate host. Um, there is uh, in, the, in bats, a uh, virus that's like 98% similar to the one that's, uh, that we find in uh, uh, humans. But there isn't any proof that uh, bats are the uh, natural host of SARS-CoV-2. And there was a suggestion at the beginning of the, of the uh, epidemic that pangolins, weird animals that uh, some people eat, I don't know why, because they are really ugly, animals, the pangolins were the uh, intermediate host, but that wasn't uh, uh, confirmed. So we don't know where the virus comes from and which one is the in in intermediate host. SARS-CoV-2 uh, is um, dangerous to men because like the spike protein, which is on the surface of the virus, binds uh, AC, uh, ACE2. ACE2 is a receptor that, that's expressed on uh, many, many different cell types. Of course, it's highly, <clears throat> it's, uh, highly prevalent on uh, cells of the uh, respiratory tract. And that explains why uh, the, the, despite the fact that SARS-CoV-2, it's a multi-system disease, uh, the, the uh, main uh, signs and, and symptoms of infections are um, um, respiratory because uh, uh, cells of the respiratory tract are express a high density of uh, ACE2. So the interaction between spike on the virus and ACE2 on human cells allows the penetration of uh, SARS-CoV-2 into uh, human cells, and then the virus replicates and you know spreads and like provokes uh, the disease. Uh, we have been extremely, extremely fast in uh, producing uh, uh, vaccines. It's an amazing, amazing uh, success of. Uh, uh, research, if you consider that like within uh, 12 months, we've gone from uh, identifying the virus, uh, sequencing the virus to producing vaccines that work. It's, uh, that has never happened before in a human uh, uh, history. So it's really uh, witnessing like the amazing uh, sophistication that uh, we have reached uh, through um, research. Uh, we have about 60 vaccines in clinical uh, dev uh, dev development and like one, uh, about one, 170 more in preclinical. So a lot of possible uh, vaccines. Some of these have been, uh, were moved into human use. So like they, they, they went through clinical phase one, two, three, they are, safe, they are, uh, they are uh, successful, they work in a fantastic way, they are used to uh, vaccinate, at least in the uh, US. In uh, Italy, you know, we are uh, struggling to obtain uh, vaccines. We don't have many uh, vaccines yet. So uh, let's briefly go through the the main, the, main, uh, the main types of vaccines that we, we can use. Let, uh, the first vaccines are um, mRNA vaccines, the um, Moderna and uh, Pfizer. And these are fantastic. The, it's, the, it's the first time that we can use uh, vaccines based on mRNA. These are vaccines that essentially um, give to the body, not proteins, uh, not the proteins of the virus, but the instructions uh, allowing uh, the, human, the human cells to build uh, the proteins of the virus. So it's a totally new concept. We don't vaccinate with the protein of the pathogen. We vaccinate with the instruction uh, that will allow the 
host cells to build the proteins. So essentially, we have two different vaccines, uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer. Both of them have a, 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 an efficacy rate that's you know over ninety five percent. So it's the, I mean they are perfect. Uh, what we do is essentially this in this these vaccines like we use the uh, R, the RNA that codifies for the spike protein, the protein that uh, allows the penetration of virus into cells. We get the uh, RNA that codifies for for the spike protein. We uh, embed it in, in, uh, with within like uh, lipid uh, lipid uh, nano particles. So lip, lipid nano particles inside which we embed RNA for the spike. Uh, we uh, int, we 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 use an uh, uh, um, uh, um, injection. The liposome uh, fuses with the host cell. The RNA with the in, inside the, the cytoplasm is uh, transcribed, and we produce. Uh, proteins, we, we produce a spike uh, proteins. Um, at that point, the cell will, the whole cell will express uh, spike proteins, will express proteins of the uh, virus. So this will be rate the proteins of the, of the virus on the surface of the vaccinated cell, will be recognized by B uh, lymphocytes. B lymphocytes will produce antibodies. Antibodies will protect us, will neutralize uh, the uh, virus will impede will, uh, the virus to bind to, to human cells. Some of the some of the spike proteins that are produced uh, by the vaccinated cell are released inside the the, the, the blood. They are captured by dent by dendritic cells. They are processed. They are present presented to um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes and will uh, lead to the generation of cytotoxic T uh, lymphocytes that will recognize infected cells and will kill them. So we are able to induce both the generation of, of antibodies and the generation of, of cytotoxic T cells using the RNA of the spike uh, uh, protein. And as I was telling you, these uh, results in an uh, amazing rate of success up to 95%. Uh, Vector vaccines are a different group of uh, uh, vaccines. They are more traditional. They, uh, in, in, in this case, what we do is like, we get an, um, a virus, an adenovirus. We delete, uh, we, we take away, we take out the genetic uh, material of the adenovirus. So we use essentially the virus as a shell. We introduce inside the adenovirus the uh, DNA of the of the uh, of this that will codify that will codify for the spike protein. And at this point, we have a, a shell an adenovirus inside which we introduce a DNA that uh, belongs to the uh, virus. Um, so, as I was saying, we have an, an adenovirus inside of which we have uh, the DNA of the of the spike of, of the spike uh, protein. Pro problem with adenoviruses is that uh, they are viruses. They are antigens. So like the first time we immunize someone with the adenovirus, so we will start generating antibodies that will uh, limit the uh, efficacy of the second time we inject the same adenovirus. Because we, as I was saying, because we generate antibodies that will recognize the adenovirus. That's why the Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, works better than the AstraZeneca, uh, because like uh, the Russians uh, use two different adenoviruses. Uh, they use adenovirus 26 for the first shot and adenovirus 5 for the second shot. So even if we develop antibodies to add the adenovirus 26 if, after the first shot, the second time we, we use adenovirus 5 and there is, you know, I mean, it's, there is there aren't antibodies to the adenovirus 5. The adenovirus, uh, which contains the 
genetic material of the of the SARS cop of the coronavirus um, gets inside the host cell. The the DNA is released of the DNA of the virus is released in the nucleus of the uh, infected of the vaccinated cell. DNA will be uh, transcribed into uh, RNA. RNA will generate for the, the spike uh, protein. So exactly the same thing as we saw with the um, Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines. Uh, the, the, the efficacy of AstraZeneca, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, various the first data said that 65%. Now it seems like it's, it seems like much better, it seems up to 80 uh, percent. But there are fantastic data coming out from of uh, Scotland showing that uh, AstraZeneca prevents uh, um, severe disease in up to 95% of people. So the message is don't hesitate. If they offer you to be vaccinated with AstraZeneca, do it. It's an excellent vaccine. Even if it's not preventing as well as uh, Moderna and Pfizer infection, it, uh, in, it will uh, prevent uh, pro progression of infection to severe COVID. And that's what you want to do. So like do it if you are offered AstraZeneca, don't uh, um, hesitate to do it. Sputnik has an efficacy rate of like 92%, so it's you know, works actually better than AstraZeneca. JJ, the Johnson and Johnson, has a, a, an efficacy rate of 75%, uh, a bit lower in South Africa. We will get to the variants at the end. Uh, the advantage is that like one dose is uh, uh, sufficient. So it's the only one of the SARS-CoV, of the coronavirus vaccines that can uh, it doesn't need a double dose. One dose is uh, sufficient. <clears throat> the Chinese vaccine is the, is the most uh, traditional way to build a vaccine. Essentially what they do is they get a whole virus, the whole SARS-CoV-2, they kill it with chemicals or, or with uh, exposure to high doses uh, UVC. And then they inject uh, the killed whole virus uh, into uh, humans to back to vaccinate them. So, like whole virus killed with uh, chemicals or uh, physical um, methods. The efficacy is uh, eighty percent for uh, Sinopharm and fifty one percent for uh, Sinovac. There are many countries in the world that are using Sinopharm and uh, Sinovac they seem to be working well. They don't seem to have any mm, severe side uh, effects. Uh, Novavax, it's the last type of vaccine that's actually in a use, and it's like a, pro a protein subunit. So in this case, we don't use genetic material from SARS-CoV-2, from the COVID virus, but we use uh, proteins. So essentially, we detach the proteins from the virus, so we purify them, we, um, we uh, prepare them, we um, incorporate them in a, a preparation that inclu includes also soap bark um, and an extract from soap bark tree which uh, recalls B and T lymphocytes of or to the site where I uh, inject the vaccine. Uh, and as a consequence, it potentiates the uh, effects of, of, the, of, the, of the vaccine. So in this case, as I was saying, we don't use uh, genetic material from the virus, we use proteins from the virus, a mix of proteins from the virus. And we adjuvant that with uh, an extract from uh, soap bar tree. The Novavax is extremely um, efficient. It's like uh, the efficiency, it's up to 90% in the uh, US, two doses. Uh, it's less efficient in, in uh, South Africa, even if newer data that came out like two days ago saying that, you know, question that, they, they seem to show that like the efficacy also in South Africa is pre pretty much comparable 
to the one that we see in the uh, US. So these are the four different types of vaccines that uh, we can use now that are now in uh, clinical use, um, RNA, vector, uh, recombinant protein, oh, this table, it's in uh, uh, Italian, sorry, uh, recombinant protein in a uh, whole um, inactive, whole killed virus. Now, the final part of the talk deals with um, uh variants the we essentially have three main uh variants the uk the south african and the uh brazilian the um, uk variant is not responsible for a more severe disease and doesn't induce any resistance to uh, uh antibodies the uk variant is uh, more dangerous for two reasons. The first reason is that like it um, uh, codifies for a viral a variant that binds better to ACE, uh, ACE2. So the interaction between the spike protein and ACE2 is more uh, powerful. That allows the virus, the UK uh, variant, to penetrate better into cells. The second problem is that, like a patient, patients that are infected with the uh, UK variant are infected for like a longer time. Uh, a patient that's infected with the original SARS-CoV-2 is infected for like eight days on average. A patient that's infected with the UK variant, it's uh, infected for uh, 12 days, so four more days. That means that like the patient will spread, as someone who's infected with the UK uh, variant will spread the virus for like a longer period. The infectivity is uh, longer. The South African variant and the Brazilian uh, variant beside sticking beta to ACE2, so like they penetrate beta into, into whole cell, also have a, a possible reduction in susceptibility to uh, uh, um, antibodies because they have the E484K uh, mutation that seems to help uh, the virus uh, uh, evade uh, the recognition by some kind of uh, um, antibodies. All this said, uh, this data just came, came out, essentially the studies conducted with the antibodies uh, generated by the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. Uh, there is no reduction in uh, neutralization uh, of the uh, UK and the South African or the Brazilian uh, variants with uh, antibodies uh, obtained from people vaccinated with the, the Pfizer vaccine. There is a slight reduction in the neutralization of the South African variant in people that are vaccinated with the uh, Moderna vaccine. Uh, but overall, the consensus is, seems to be that like it's not going to be a problem. The good news is also that uh, uh, RNA vaccines are extremely flexible. So it, if we will need to change the composition, it will be very simple to do it. If a, var a, a variant will uh, um, uh, come up that like uh, will resist the, the, the neutralization, neutralization by antibodies, it, it will be very simple, very fast to build a new, a slightly different vaccine that will take care of that uh, problem. Uh, okay, Marcella, I'm done. Thank you, Professor Clerici. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, to introduce uh, uh, Professor Zivadinov, who will start uh, uh, the discussion and the last Q and A session. Uh, professor Zivadinov is a professor of neurology and director of BINAC, the Buffalo Neuroimaging Analysis Center at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences of Buffalo. He's also director of the Center of Biomedical Imaging at the Clinical Translational Science Institute at the University of Buffalo. 
City University of uh, New York. Thank you, Professor Zivanilo. Hello. Thank you, Marcella, and thank you, Professor Clerici, for a wonderful talk. Um, I would try to be brief, uh, maybe come up with five or six bullet points for, uh, of summary uh, uh, of Professor Clerici presentation and maybe where we need to go next and uh, and then maybe pose some questions and then we'll open for the discussion to, to everybody who is online. So clearly these 13 months uh, that have elapsed from the identification of this virus have been uh, uh, followed by an exceptional effort and more to find the cure for this uh, virus with more than 300 actually vaccine projects currently ongoing. I think that we have seen a really uh, uh, exceptional pre-availability of science that has allowed uh, uh, collaborators between academic and industry centers to create uh, with the newly new technological efforts the vaccine that uh, may really uh, not just uh, be effective for uh, COVID, but can really change the efforts how we are really uh, designing new vaccines for a number of uh, different diseases. And uh, it's likely that these different vaccines will show to, especially respect to COVID, to be better suited for certain human groups that I don't think has been uh, sufficiently investigated. As we heard, there are over 40 undergoing clinical evaluations with more than uh, uh, 10 or, or 15 phase three trials. Five or six of them have been concluded and uh, several vaccines have been approved uh, both in North America and Europe and around the world for emergency use. What remains to be elucidated is whether uh, it, what's the extent of the capacity of these vaccines in terms of uh, their uh, increase in immunological fitness by training uh, specifically innate immunity uh, to COVID and uh, uh, respect to pathogen uh, agnostic protection. But uh, we should not uh, forget that uh, uh, there has been also a high financial support both from private consortia and governments, which made this uh, uh, development of vaccines uh, so quickly. And uh, the technical problems connected with uh, the production of really billions of doses uh, uh, needed for the whole population uh, uh, raises the ethical question uh, uh, how to deliver this vaccine to the poorest countries, uh, and uh, uh, how to really uh, uh, vaccinate as many as possible people as, as soon. And these are probably the biggest challenges that are facing us. Uh, uh, we also need to understand the long-term goals and safety of these vaccines, which is certainly one of the biggest uh, impediment at the moment for the whole world population, as you uh, know, to, to get vaccinated uh, and, 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 and close this nightmare. So I would like to follow with three open questions to Professor Clarici. The first one, uh, do you think very simply that we will be able to control this pandemic? The second one is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, 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 this vaccine will be able to protect most fragile uh, populations uh, uh, around the world, and and uh, finally, can we overcome financial and political problems uh, and allow COVID vaccines to become available uh, for the entire world population? So I will stop here. Thank you. <laughs> That's that. Those are, those are like very big questions. Uh, thank you. Well, I mean. Um, I'm an optimist, so I'm absolutely convinced that like we will be able to stop this nightmare, this pandemic. Once we will vaccinate at least uh, you know 65 to 70 uh, percent of our people, that's gonna be done, and we will be able to do it. Um, also, because let's not forget that like uh, 
we have vaccines for um, COVID, but we do not have a, a therapy yet. You know, we do not know yet how to cure patients. I mean, we know that like, you know, when they get bad, we ventilate them and, 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 uh, and we take care of them in that way. But there aren't any drugs that are, there's no consensus on how to treat uh, a COVID-19 patient. And there is no way in which we can uh, prevent uh, uh, the disease from becoming severe if uh, mm, that's gonna happen. We don't have a clinical uh, standard to treat uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. So the goal is to prevent uh, people from getting uh, sick. That's the only way to do it. Uh, regarding the question of like, um, should we use vaccines for, um frail people yes absolutely the only vaccines that are potentially dangerous in say immuno uh, suppressed hosts or like you know tumoral patients or like you know patients with autoimmune conditions are the vaccines uh, uh, that use uh, live uh, virus but like none of the vaccines that are actually in use for SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 are based on live uh, virus. So they are all safe. The only precaution is uh, it, it's prob probably better to use an RNA vaccine in a severely immunocompromised host. It's better to use probably uh, Pfizer and uh, uh, Moderna instead than uh, AstraZeneca in a severely immunocompromised uh, host. And the last question, the political question, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a big one, but like, uh, I wouldn't know. I mean, I hope our politicians will be like smart and wise and generous enough to like, you know, vaccinate also people in poor countries. Let's see what's what's gonna happen. Thank you, thank you. Thank so you. if there are questions online or if anybody from the panel uh, wants to uh, pose a question, please do at this time. Yes, I'll have a, a question for Professor Clarity. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. My question is regarding how do we clinically follow the responsiveness of vaccines, particularly now that we have different types of vaccines being used in the general population. For example, in the United States alone, different companies are using different assays to track their vaccine responsiveness. Abbott, for example, uses anti-nucleocapsid uh, antibody to track the responsiveness. However, that will come falsely negative after vaccinated patient. On the other side, Vitreos is using anti-spike protein to determine the efficacy. So uh, do we use multiple assays analyzers to check for efficacy or how do we approach that, that aspect of, of the vaccine? That's, a, uh, that's, a, very, that's a, a very good question. Thank you. Um, the, sim the simplest way to answer is we don't need to do it. You know, like after all, like we, all of our kids and all of us have been back, uh, vaccinated for, you know, for tetanus, for polio, for like, uh, uh, measles and like none of us has been checked like you know we know that the vaccine works so we don't need to check that like it really does work uh, this being a new vaccine there might be you know I mean it's in, in, interesting to uh, follow immune um, responses in uh, time uh, the best way to to do that is to measure antibodies to the spike uh, protein and would be like also to measure the generation and the persist persistence of uh, cyto cytotoxic T cells. So like if I would have to do that, I mean, we are doing that uh, in Italy uh, for research uh, purpose, but like, uh, again, there is no need to do it. We, we, we know that vaccines work and like you don't really, really need to you know, follow up uh, uh, vaccines. Okay. Thank you, though. Thank you for the question. I see there is a question from uh, Professor Baselli. He wrote it uh, uh, in, the, in the chat. Professor Baselli, do you want to, to read the question? 
Uh, yes. I'm not uh, taking any questions from Elbeck, uh, no, absolutely not. Oh, I have uh, something. Uh, okay, perfect. Come on. Even even worse, uh, which, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sending that to to Zinari. It was about financing, uh, so this is a uh, as a private message. But anyway, uh, the question was uh, trying to make a link between the two speech speeches. Uh, so suppose that uh, Clive is uh, burning with his UVCs, the some viruses, and accidentally I was exposed to these inactivated uh, viruses. Could I gain some immunity? Absolutely, yes. I think I think Clive was uh, suggesting that one of the one of the you know effects of like the fact that uh, you know humid, uh, I mean he, he said it in a fantastic way you know the um, physical conditions that modify and inactivate the virus might actually be a natural uh, vaccine if you get exposed to like a virus that has been. Uh, uh, um, inactivated, you know, by the U, uh, UVC or by, you know, uh, different condition of uh, uh, humidity, you are actually will gain um, in an immunity. It's like if you are vaccinated with the Chinese uh, uh, vaccine. But Clive, I'm sure you are going to be able to... to well, I, 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 to be honest, I don't think I had said that, but actually I think it's brilliant, I, a brilliant thing. And I meet, uh, intend to raise it with the Department of Health in the UK as soon as I get back off here and maybe follow that up. I, I think that's extremely interesting because uh, we, we just don't know. But if we can even irradiate uh, a small proportion of the aerosols and you take in a dose, you may get an immune response and build antibodies to it. That is extremely exciting and needs to be investigated. I am not aware of any papers on that. Yeah. Maybe, we, maybe that's something that we should be doing. Um, you know, on a, on a you know general thing. So please keep the uh, the lines of communication open on that one. I think it's a very Absolutely. important. Great question, uh, uh, Beppe. If, uh, I'm permitted. I would like to make a, a, a strange comment about the question which was raised by Professor. Zivadinov about the huge importance of financing science, which is really giving us the result now. After at, at least uh, in, in Italy, a very long period of a very, very poor uh, financing and even mistrusting size, etc. This was written by me. I was a little bit emotional, so pardon me. And also it is a limerick Clive should know that Limerick <laughs> are uh, yep. uh, poems which are nonsense uh, or supposed to be nonsense. Uh, it's uh, the virus from Wuhan. There was a virus from Wuhan that fast the world did run. Th they cried, what a nature's violence. Let's get back to that costly science, that extravagant virus from Wuhan. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, it's not the virus who extravagant, but they are extravagant. Those who are crying, uh, okay, uh, that costly science. Can I can I add something to that? You might find uh, interesting. In the UK, on the BBC, we have a program called More or Less, which attempts to look at statistics and look at claims. And someone had written in and said, "How many viral particles? What's the mass of the viral particles in the world that have caused this pandemic?" And they came up with something like 125 milliliters. It was uh, it was uh, it was about half a coke can of viral particles has caused all this mayhem. So it gives you an idea of, of what this, it's, it's incredible that that's provoked and the, the cost of that. Yeah. Yes. Also, going back to your uh, uh, sanitization of the indoor air, uh, we must uh, remember that uh, uh, even if we had not the pandemia, there were already many, many reasons to start doing that well ahead of the COVID. 
because uh, thousands of old people are dying and they are any uh, winter just for a, a trivial flu. And uh, this does not go on the newspapers. We uh, are losing billions of uh, euros or dollars of what you want every single winter time because of people not staying at home for a flu. And uh, we are doing nothing to keep uh, the uh, quality of air indoor in the working place, uh, in the theaters, in the cinemas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, could, could I maybe address that? Uh, uh, that the, the, this raises a very, very large error in the medical textbooks, uh, essentially. Um, the definition of airborne and droplet borne is very, very uh, archaic in the in the textbooks that are often used, and this is changing them. It's it's causing us to rip them all up this pandemic. But essentially, airborne was defined by the medical profession as anything that caused a disease. TB was an aer aerosol, uh, an airborne disease that caused a disease that with droplet nuclei that went down into the deep alveoli. Measles is also classed as an airborne disease, a true airborne disease. Traditionally, influenza and many other viral diseases are classed as respiratory droplets, as is COVID. And the idea was that if you kept away more than a meter away or two meters away, it would not spread. And of course, as you rightly say, uh, it's spreading people, you know, in the average year in the UK, we, we lose about seven or 8,000 people to, to influenza. Mm -hmm. um, and many days off work and in fact now we're realizing that most of the um, most of the uh, transmission or much of the transmission is actually by fine aerosols we're having to reappraise that whole thing about influenza uh, and uh, in fact one of the earlier pieces of work on influenza is actually the, the, the largest transmission was when people actually were inoculated so they compared inoculations in the nasal cavity with those where it was in the influenza virus was actually nebulized deep into the lungs and they got much severer uh, infections with the, 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 the virus nebulized into the lungs than in the nasal inoculations. So this is causing us to reappraise the whole thing really. Thank you, Clive. I think that we are a little bit uh, out of time. I will uh, give back the floor to Marcella. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I have only one uh, last question, a very, uh, very short uh, for Professor Clerici. Uh, how long is it expected to man maintain antibodies after the vac vaccine? Is it the same duration as after the COVID infection? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, very, that's, a very, that's a very hot topic because of course, like we do not know because we started vaccinating a few months, uh, well, I mean, three months um, ago. From an immunological point of view, this is a virus exactly like any other virus. So I don't see why we shouldn't uh, be able to retain antibodies for uh, years, years and years. But only time will uh, tell. Okay, I don't see other questions uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, aren't there other questions uh, in from the panelists? No. So if not, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the uh, speakers and uh, uh, and uh, the this discussant and uh, uh, I. I want to uh, to show you only uh, the list of the past webinars and uh, to tell you that uh, there will be another webinar soon of the ISMVD. Uh, it is about neurofluids, physiology, uh, methods, and diseases, uh, and uh, it uh, it's organized by Professor Toro and Dr. Mueller. Uh, it will be on March twenty sixth. So, uh, so if you go on the website, uh, there will be uh, the uh, the link uh, um, to the brochure and how to uh, to connect. So uh, thank you again to all uh, uh, the attendees and all the speakers, uh, discussants, uh, and the panelists. Thank you.
Thank it was you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.